So we get that the world is heating up, but why is everyone calling it a climate crisis? That's a bit much, isn't it? Well, the Earth is hotter than it has ever been since our earliest ancestors arrived at the party, already with devastating consequences. And we're on track to crank it up even further. The results of which experts tell us would be catastrophic for the survival and well-being of millions of people on Earth. So crisis actually makes a lot of sense, especially when you consider we're cutting it quite fine. The world is a pretty overwhelming place right now. It's a global pandemic. Increased social inequality. Political polarization. And that ever-present thorn in our side, climate change. Climate change. Climate Extreme climate weather. Sea levels are rising. Biodiversity is reportedly declining. We have left the world in a climate emergency. In this series, we'll explore how we got here, where we're headed, and what we can do to make a difference. This is The Breakdown. In the decade, we were learning to surf the web, create masterpieces in paint, and dance the Macarena. The United Nations were preoccupied with something considerably less fun. After coming to the sobering realization that man-made climate change had become unavoidable, they started bringing together world leaders to discuss what should be done. This yearly get-together became known as COP. The COP stands for COP, Conference of the Parties. That's Christiana. She's kind of a big deal when it comes to these conferences, but more on that later. The first significant COP took place in Kyoto, where industrialized nations agreed for the first time to limit and reduce greenhouse gas emissions. At the time, it seemed like a big deal. But perhaps unsurprisingly, nothing really happened. Every year, these conferences came and went without much to write home about. Durban, Doha, Warsaw, Lima, and then, in 2015, something remarkable happened in Paris. Remember I said Christiana was sort of a big deal? Well, she was one of the main architects of the Paris Climate Agreement. It is an agreement of conviction it is an agreement of solidarity with the most vulnerable. It is an agreement of long-term vision. It was hailed as a major groundbreaking piece of diplomacy. You've probably heard of it before, possibly because Donald Trump famously left it in 2017, or maybe more recently, when the new US President Joe Biden rejoined it. But what exactly is it? It's a legally binding pathway signed by 195 countries, and it's essentially an agreement to keep global warming to well below two degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels. The question is, why two degrees? In order to understand this, it helps to look at a graph of average temperature rise. Since the Industrial Revolution, temperatures have increased by 1.1 degree, and we're already seeing the effects. Currently, we're on track for three to four degrees of warming, by the end of this century, I'll leave David to explain what that means. So at four degrees of warming, we're thinking about something like $600 trillion in global climate damages, which is twice the wealth that exists in the world today. There would be parts of the planet that would be hit by six climate-driven natural disasters at once. We're talking about conflict all around the world, uh, well more than doubling, and uh, global agricultural yields falling by at least half. Which is why the Paris Climate Agreement says we can't go above two degrees Celsius. But then, just a few years later, in 2018, a group of the world's top climate scientists published an explosive report suggesting that the Paris Agreement didn't go far enough. The report suggested that if we want a chance at a habitable future, global temperatures must not rise above 1.5 degrees. A change of just half a degree, they said, would make all the difference for ecosystems, livelihoods. Um, it's very clear that a half a degree matters. At 1.5 degrees, 80% of the world's coral reefs would disappear. But half a degree more, and there'd be none at all. At 1.5 degrees, the Arctic would experience an ice-free summer, a devastating phenomena every 100 years. 
but turn up the thermostat by half a degree, and it would happen every 10 years. A shift from 1.5 to 2 degrees may sound like nothing at all, but it would drag 50% more people into climate-related poverty, significantly worsening the risk of drought, floods, extreme heat, and food scarcity for hundreds of millions of people. That's the difference between 1.5 and 2. So we used to think, ah, and the Paris Agreement is like, well, 2 degrees, but aiming for 1.5. Well, that you can now delete. We cannot aim for 2. We have to aim for 1.5. The IPCC report didn't stop there. It went on to say that if we're going to stay below this limit, carbon emissions need to decline well before 2030 which is why we now have less than nine years to halve global emissions. Achieving this would require rapid, far-reaching, and unprecedented transformations in almost every aspect of society. That report launched um, a huge wave of activism unlike we've ever seen in climate. You saw uh, Greta Thunberg strike, the Sunrise Movement here in the US. Like People began to care about this issue in a way that they had never cared about or understood it before. People are rising up, and as a result, governments are starting to respond. In the United States, the Biden administration is rolling out an ambitious clean energy and environmental justice plan. They've set a commitment to net zero by 2050. In the UK, Prime Minister Boris Johnson has outlined a 10-point plan for a green industrial revolution to reduce emissions by 68% by the end of the decade. And in 2020, China announced it would hit peak emissions by 2030 before reaching net zero by 2060. So things are looking up. But as we all know, politicians are highly prone to an unfortunate affliction, promise amnesia. Later this year, COP26 will be hosted in Glasgow, and it's up to us to help them remember. Now, it's even more important that these countries come together at the end of this year to review what they have done and be very public about what else they're going to do. There is going to be a rising expectation throughout this year that countries put themselves on a path for halving emissions by 2030. This is a crisis. There's no doubt about that. But it is also a chance to rethink the aspects of our society that aren't working to redevelop our economy and our energy industries, creating millions of new jobs in the process. This is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to create a greener, cleaner and fairer planet for everyone. Now is the time to put pressure on our elected officials to make sure that unlike the cops of the past, COP26 in Glasgow is remembered as the moment governments of the world finally took significant and lasting action. Our future literally does depend on it. To learn more about how to take action on the climate crisis, check out our Instagram account, Earthrise Studio. In other episodes of The Breakdown, we explore topics like climate denial, climate justice, and climate solutions. There's loads you can do about climate change. Here are a few actions that are relevant to this episode. This series was made possible by Waterbear Network, a new and interactive platform that allows you to watch content about the future of our planet and directly take action. It's totally free to create an account, so why not check it out?